uh, welcome to uh, webinar uh, organized by the Institute of Policy Research, Kuala Lumpur. Uh, we are fortunate uh, uh, today we have uh, Dr. Reza uh, Kazemi, uh, a person who uh, among us perhaps know the best, uh, the author of the, the book of certainty that we will discuss uh, today. Uh, that is uh, Abu Bakar Surajuddin, or also known as uh, Dr. Martin Link. Yeah. Uh, uh, this, perhaps, uh, to my knowledge, is the first book published by uh, the late Dr. Martin Link. Yeah. And perhaps as a beginning uh, for the benefit of the others, yeah, Dr. Reza Kazemi would introduce the book, uh, The Circumstances of Its Writing. Uh, and the overall message of the book. Yes, please, Dr. Reza. Thank you very much, Mr. Khalid Jafar um, and the IKD for organizing the seminar, the webinar over Zoom. Um, what I think is probably best to do at the moment is to contextualize the writing of this book in two ways. One, in relation to the actual writing, the composition of the book, um, Dr. Ling's was asked by friends in Egypt in the early 1950s when he left Cairo and came back to live in England. His friends were very upset that he was leaving them, and he asked, they asked him if he could leave something for them, and he said he would write a book for them. Um, and he based the book on the commentary by Abdul Razak al Kashani in the school of Ibn Arabi. But at the time, it was only referred to as the commentary, the Quran commentary of Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi. Only recently, in the last few decades, scholars have understood that this is actually by Kashani. So Dr. Lins wrote this book. Um, attempting to distill the quintessence of Sufi Quranic exegesis. And he wove into the commentaries on certain verses of the Quran, he wove into that a universalist perspective. So that his aim in writing the book, as we'll see in a moment when I read from the preface, was to make accessible some of the great gems of universal spirituality expressed through commentaries on the Quranic verses. So that's the first way of contextualizing the book. He wrote it, but only for the purpose of, uh, in the initial purpose was to satisfy the request of friends. Um, but it's interesting to note that uh, another context for this, and in relation to our company, Green Knight Multimedia, and I believe we'll be sharing this webinar over the two sites, IKD and Green Knight, um, is that Dr. Ling's had a particular love for the Celtic expression of Christian spirituality and the commonalities between Celtic spirituality and Islamic spirituality have been noted by various scholars. And in particular, one notices this in culture and art. The, the uh, geometric arabesque designs are very common to both of these great traditions. And Fritjof Schuon went so far as to say that Celtic Christianity was a kind of springtime of Christianity in the West. And he referred to it in terms of uh, a kind of last out breath of the primordial tradition expressing itself through Christianity within its Celtic mythological uh, framework. So one anecdote I want to share with you um, is that we were sitting having dinner with Dr. Ling's one evening here and 
he said that there was a remarkable overflow of the barakah, the blessings of the Quranic revelation in Britain about 50 years or so after the death of the Holy Prophet. And he said there was a, a, a man called Kadmon, C-A-E-D-M-O-N, Kadmon, who was in charge of the animals at the great monastery of Whitby in Yorkshire. And he, one night, he was, after, after tending the animals, he was with the other monks. And the, the custom at the time was that a harp would be passed around and each person would put lyrics to a certain melody. And he could never do this. He couldn't recite poetry. He was no good at singing. So he retired from the hall and he went to sleep in the barn with the animals. And in the barn, he sleeps and he has a dream. And in the dream, a figure comes to him and says to him, sing, Cadmo. And Cadmo says, I can't sing. And then the voice, presumably an angelic voice, says, sing of the beginning of creation. Now, we don't have the exact Anglo-Saxon of that. We only have the Latin, which is in Bede's ecclesiastical history. But the Latin says, Principium Creatororum, the beginning of creatures. And Dr. Ling said this is remarkable, that it was a kind of recapitulation of the kind of dialogue that the Holy Prophet had with the angel Gabriel. And the Principium Creatororum, the beginning of creatures, the principle of creatures, Capitulates very well, recapitulates the, the saying of the angel, Iqra bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. Read, recite, sing in the name of your Lord who created. So this is an almost identical dialogue. And what makes it all the more remarkable is that when Kadmon wakes up uh, and tells the monks what had happened, they take him to the abbess of the monastery, who happens to be a woman, her name is uh, Hilda. And this was a monastery where men and women lived in separate quarters, but in the same site. Quite remarkable. This was, as I say, a golden age of, of the Celtic form of Christianity, even though through the Anglo-Saxons on the whole, but with the Celtic influence coming from the Irish, uh, coming over from Iona and Lindisfarne. And so St. Hilda says, well, if he can do this again, Let's see, recite more scripture to him and see if he can put the scripture into poetic form. And he was able to do this. So it said that thousands and thousands of people came to witness this miracle, this marvel, this illiterate person who overnight had become capable of putting into the most beautiful Anglo-Saxon poetry all of the great stories of the Old Testament. And it said that he died a saintly death some people regard him as a saint, Saint Cadmon, others not. But Dr. Ling said this was a remarkable overflow, as it were, of the barakah, the blessings of the Quranic revelation expressing itself here. And so I just wanted to give that as a particular angle of entry into this series of, of seminars that we'll be having for the Green Knight Multimedia, which is very much about, we're hoping to, uh, uh, stimulate thought and discussion on Celtic themes of, of mythology and spirituality, the Arthurian legends and so on, coming all the way through into our own times with the similar representations of the Green Knight figure, most prominently Al-Khidr in Islam, the Green Man, uh, that we will come to also in the course of these seminars, but very much more in the course of subsequent ones on other subjects. So that's how I'd like to uh, begin this seminar and the reading that we will have today is a short one, a preface that uh, was written uh, for the second edition that came about 
1996. It was published by the Islamic Tech Society first in 92 and then reprinted in 1996. So the title of the book is as follows. The Book of Certainty, the Sufi Doctrine of Faith, Vision and Gnosis by Abu Bakr Siraj Din, also known as Dr. Martin Lind. Preface. This little book perhaps needs some explanation for Western readers, chiefly because in the first place, although written in English, it was not written for them. It was written at the request of one or two Egyptian friends and was subsequently translated into Arabic without a thought at that time of its ever being published in any European language. Our aim has been to express in the language of Sufism some of the universal truths which lie at the heart of all religions. Each chapter serves as a commentary upon some verse or verses of the Quran. The book is also based on various sayings of the Prophet and, to a certain extent, upon a Quranic commentary attributed to Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. Footnote 1. It is published under his name by Messrs. Halabi of Cairo, but most scholars now attribute it to his great follower and commentator Kashani. And in view of the doubts as to its authorship, we refer to it throughout the rest of the book, wherever it has been followed, as the commentary. Back to the main text. As regards other influence, the reader will notice that many points of doctrine are introduced simply with the words, they say, or it is said. These words are to be taken quite literally, for it must be remembered that a great part of Sufi teaching is unwritten and even anonymous. The same truths have been passed down from master to disciple for generation after generation. And without the help of such oral teaching, this book could never have been written. Its purpose is positive, for it was written in the intention of affirming truth, not of denying error. But we will mention here that insofar as it amounts to a definition of Sufism, it may be taken indirectly as a denial of certain false ideas. For example, it will be clear to anyone who understands this book that without Sufism, Islam would be like a circumference without a centre. That the first Sufi in all but name is the Prophet himself, and that Sufism is therefore as old as Islam. In fact, far from being a later development, as some people maintain, Sufism was never so generally widespread in proportion to the total number of the faithful as it was during the life of the Prophet. The same, or rather the equivalent, is necessarily true of every other religion. As is mentioned in the text, the Quran divides the faithful into two groups, the foremost and those of the right. Sufism comprises the doctrine and the methods of the foremost. The path which they follow is called tariqah, and this term is used by extension to denote a Sufi brotherhood. Footnote 2. This does not, of course, mean that every member of a Sufi brotherhood can be called one of the foremost. In order to have the possibility of being among these, one must first of all be following a path. And today the vast majority of the members do not actually move along the tariqa, but remain stationary, not being travellers. Salikun. As to the term Sufi, it may not be applied, strictly speaking, to anyone who has not reached the end of the journey. End of footnote. 
The practices of the tariqa are in addition, but not in opposition, to what the sharia, the sacred law, prescribes for every believer. Esoterism includes exoterism. Failure to carry out strictly the commands of the Sharia would amount to a disqualification for entry into one of the Sufic brotherhoods. The Quran, which is the basis of both Tariqa and Sharia, affirms continually the transcendence of God and also his immediate presence as do the sacred books of all orthodox religions. But because Sufi writers, inasmuch as the tariqa is the way of approach to God, tend to dwell especially upon his immediate presence, as expressed in his names, the near, the hearer, the seer, it has been concluded by some that Sufism is pantheistic. This conclusion is totally false. As has been said in defense of the Red Indian against the same accusation of pantheism, it may also be said of the Sufi that, quote, he is nothing of a pantheist, nor does he imagine for one moment that God is in the world, but he knows that the world is mysteriously plunged in God. Fritjof Schuon, The Feathered Sun, Bloomington 1990, page 68. See also Titus Burkhart, An Introduction to Sufi Doctrine. Chapter 3, Martin Ling's A Sufi Saint of the 20th Century, Chapter 5. End of footnote. The Quran says of the foremost that there were many in earlier times, but that there will be few in later times. In view of this last prediction, the publication of an esoteric book at a time like the present may seem indiscreet and even irregular. But one irregularity sometimes calls for another. In the modern world, which is so irregular in every respect, many believers, whatever their confession, have become skeptics and even infidels for want of finding in their religion an intellectual satisfaction. We therefore feel justified in making public one or two ideas which may afford a glimpse of the intellectual essence of all revelation. The publication of this third edition gives us the opportunity of making some revisions and additions not without importance to the text of the previous editions. Abu Bakr Sirajuddin. So uh, I will start to comment a little bit on this, these three pages, but first I will open up to any questions that may have occurred to the members of our seminar in the course of the reading. So are there any questions? Uh, perhaps, uh, Dr. Reza, uh, you can explain a little bit what is meant by pantheism. Yeah. Is it, uh, uh, it seems that a kind of uh, heretical doctrine, yeah. And and in history of uh, the South, there was a debate about uh, that wujud, yeah. Perhaps you you might be able to enlighten uh, what is the significance of uh, Dr. Martin Ling's uh, raising the issue in the preface of the book. Yeah. yeah well, let's look again at what he said. Um, that both the tariqa and the sharia emphasize within Islam, they emphasize the transcendence of God above all creation, what is called tanzi, as opposed to tashbi. Tanzi is 
the affirmation of the absolute transcendence, ineffability of the reality, the essence of God above and beyond all created phenomena. But Tashbi opens up a perspective of what Dr. Ling's here refers to as his immediate presence. And he puts those words in capitals, immediate with a capital I, presence with a capital P. As expressed in his names, the seer, sorry, the near, al-qarib, the hearer, the seer, al-samir, al-basir. So this is what the Sufis emphasize. In addition to the transcendence of God, his absence, if you like, the aspect of the alam al ghaib the hidden, the unseen world, the invisible, the uncreated. But you also have the alam al-shahada, that which is witnessed, the immediate world. And in that immediacy, God is absolutely present, even while being mysteriously absent by virtue of transcendence. He's present by virtue of imminence. So through his imminence within all things, he, she, or it, because remember, we refer to God as he, just as a matter of, 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 of language, but the essence of God is above all gender. So in shorthand, we refer to Allah as he, but when we refer in Arabic to the essence of God, that Allah, we refer grammatically to she. So we should always keep in mind, when we keep saying he for God, we should always keep in mind that the essence of God, referred to in Arabic, is she. We should always remember that. So he, Allah, is infinitely remote, absent, transcendent. But that remoteness does not prevent the mystery of his presence, his nearness. The fact that he hears and sees and is present with us in this world. So this emphasis on God's presence in the world has led some to conclude that Sufism is pantheistic. And by pantheistic here, Dr. Ling is, right, is referring to what you rightly also refer to as wahdat al-wujud, that many people think that Ibn Arabi's doctrine of the oneness of being implies pantheism, that God is present in the world and is constituted by the totality of the phenomena of the created universe. That this notion of pantheism, that pan meaning all in Greek, and theism going back to theos, that God is in all, is all, and nothing but all. This is what we have to add in order to understand what pantheism, what the error of pantheism is. For the pantheist, God is everything and is exhausted by the totality of created phenomena. So that the totality of the divine nature, the totality of the divine reality is embedded within and therefore limited by all of the phenomena in the created universe. So what have we done? We've reduced the creator to the creation. There is no transcendence of the creator above the creation. So the crucial notion that the pantheists lack is the notion of transcendence. If the pantheists would say that God is in everything, with everything, uh, alongside everything, and so on and so forth, as you have in the great uh, hikmah of Ibn Atayl al-Iskandari, that how can God be absent from you when he is ma'a kulli shay, fi kulli shay, ala kulli shay. He is in everything, above everything, and so on. He is everything. But then they always add that he is transcendent, above everything. So if the pantheist accepted the absolute transcendence of God alongside his mysterious presence, then he would not be called a pantheist in the negative sense of the term. He would be called a, um, as, as Shuan referred to with the Red Indians, I just repeat what he said, 
that the Red Indian is nothing of a pantheist, nor does he imagine for one moment that God is in the world, meaning that God is only in the world, or that the totality of God is somehow found within the world. But he knows, Shuan says, that the world is mysteriously plunged in God. So there we're going from an, a crude notion of pantheism, which lacks transcendence, into a subtle notion of panentheism, to use the, the term in Greek. Panentheism, everything is in God. So everything is mysteriously plunged in God, as opposed to saying that God is only in all things. Everything is, the whole cosmos is within God, therefore God's presence can never be denied within this cosmos that itself is within the divine. Uh, one of the names that expresses this very well in Arabic in, in the Quran is Al-Muhit, that God is the all-encompassing, that by virtue of his name Al-Muhit, he is the environment. He is the environment within which the cosmos lives and breathes and has its being. So, to go from pantheism to panentheism, we need to do two things, simply to say that God's transcendence is affirmed and that his transcendence does not in any way diminish the mystery of his imminence, which implies presence alongside his apparent absence by way of transcendence. It's a circular way of putting it, but I think that should be enough on that subject. Is there any other question that may arise? All right, so let's go back to the point that he makes here. Yes, he says that many of the points of doctrine are introduced simply with the words they say or it is said. These words are to be taken quite literally, for it must be remembered that a great part of Sufi teaching is unwritten and even anonymous. The same truths have been passed down from master to disciple for generation after generation. And without the help of such oral teaching, this book could never have been written. So here Dr. Lings is saying that I have benefited from the oral transmission of teachings that perforce remain unwritten, they will not be written down, they're passed down through the oral tradition because they are of such a nature that they do not necessarily have an isnad, a chain of transmission going all the way back to the prophet or this master or that, because, precisely because, and this is what Dr. Ling has told us several times, there were certain things that were so esoteric in their nature that they would be dangerous to be divulged to people who were not ready to understand these truths. And he used to give the example of Abu Huraira in the Sunni tradition, one of the great, the great uh, transmitters of hadith. And he said that I received from the prophet two bags of knowledge. One of them I've opened and showed you the contents. If I opened the other, you would, and he made a gesture, you would slit my throat. He went like this. They were so esoteric. Also, Dr. Lings used to say that when the prophet would come into a gathering, he would not necessarily know everybody or be able to see everybody if it was at night. So he would say, Hal fina gharib? Is there a stranger amongst us? And the ones closest to him would know that he wanted to understand whether there was someone who would not be fit or ready to receive the esoteric teachings he was about to impart. So those are the kinds of hadith that would not be written down or transmitted to everybody with a strong isnad and so on. So it might be said that the most esoteric sayings of the Prophet are the ones that precisely have no isnad because they were not told to everybody for everybody. And I think quite soon in the next chapter, we have two of the, uh, an example of one of these sayings at least, that Anna Arab, Bila Ain wa ana Ahmad Bila Meen. I am an Arab without the Ain, the letter Ain, and I am an uh, I am Ahmad without the letter Meen. 
So when you take away the Ain from Arab, you have Rab. I am Rab. And when you take away the letter Mim from Ahmad, you have Ahad. I am the one. So you have an affirmation of the divine identity, the what Lings and the perennialists call the supreme identity. Another way of saying Tawheed, absolute Tawheed, but understood imminently as the, the imminent selfhood manifesting through the illusory appearance of the person. So uh, those sayings are necessarily esoteric and they will not be written down and this oral tradition is all important. Now to go to the end of the preface, he says, why then are we divulging these esoteric truths if they were originally not meant for everybody? Why are we now writing books about it and talking about, I am the Rab, I am the one, al-halaj and al-haq. Why is everyone now divulging these esoteric truths? And here he says that, that because the Quran says of the foremost, the sabiqun, that there were many in earlier times, but there are few in later times. In view of this last prediction, the publication of an esoteric book at a time like the present may seem indiscreet and even irregular. But one irregularity sometimes calls for another. In the modern world, which is so irregular in every respect, many believers, whatever their confession, have become skeptics and even infidels for want of finding in their religion an intellectual satisfaction. We therefore feel justified in making public one or two ideas which may afford a glimpse of the intellectual essence of all revelation. So see, here he's making it clear why an esoteric book like this in the modern world, which is far from being suited or apt or ready to receive these messages. He's saying because the modern world is so irregular that ordinary people have lost their faith in their tradition because there are no intellectually satisfying answers to the questions that modernism has posed. Modern philosophy poses questions that traditional arguments based on faith and traditional theology cannot answer because they lack the esoteric wisdom relating to the, the truths, the deepest esoteric inner truths of religion, of which outer theology, outer argumentation uh, are, is absent. They, they don't have access. They have an expression of those esoteric truths, but they're filtered through various veils that disguise the full impact of those esoteric truths. So traditional theology, traditional argumentation would not have need of those esoteric truths precisely because the faith in the hearts of the believers was still strong. So it just needed, for example, the classic problem of why is there suffering in the world? Why is there evil in the world? The, class, the problem known as theodicy. How can you justify the ways of God when there are so much evil in the world. This has become a classic problem because the faith of ordinary people who in the past would have been confronted by all these calamities and problems, but would never once question the existence of a wise and a just and a merciful creator, all powerful and all good. It wouldn't be questioned by ordinary believers in traditional times because the faith would suffice. And one or two simple arguments from a theologian would suffice to awaken a conscience, a consciousness of the reality of God. So no major esoteric arguments would be required in those times, traditional times. But today, modern times, since the Enlightenment, modern philosophy, um, skepticism, agnosticism and atheism have, as it were, deflated the faith of believers all over the world, and including in the Muslim world now, in the last couple of hundred years since colonialism. So we, in the modern world, whether we're East or West, we all have a much greater need of the argumentation, careful, explicit, philosophical exposition 
based on esoteric wisdom derived from some degree of what we would call intellectual inspiration, understanding intellect in the full sense, not as some partial rational faculty, but as the nous in Greek, the intellectus in Latin. And here I would just add something that Dr. Linz used to emphasize a great deal about the word intellect. He would say that throughout the Middle Ages in the Western Christian world, it was the conception of Boethius on the intellect that prevailed in the teaching. And that his great teacher, Dr. Lings's great teacher, C.S. Lewis, would begin his classes, his lectures, with, uh, on the blackboard, he would write intellectus at the top. Then he would say ratio. He would write the word ratio, reason, under intellect. Then the word imaginatio imagination. Then the word sensus, the senses. And C.S. Lewis would emphasize that from Boethius onwards, the understanding of the intellect at the top of this hierarchy was that the intellect was fundamentally concerned by its very nature and essence. It, was con it is concerned with things of the other world, with things of a transcendent order, with the inner reality of what the ratio, the reason, sees only the surface of. So the intellect sees in depth what the reason can only see on the surface, and the intellect sees in height what the reason cannot possibly attain with its prolongations in logical argumentation. So the intellect relates both to the transcendent reality, things of the next world, of God, of the hereafter, of the divine nature, and of the deepest ways in which that those transcendent truths are manifest and present in this world. So these intellectual arguments presuppose, properly intellectual arguments, presuppose uh, a development of the spiritual intuitive faculty, which then expresses itself through the reason, but is by no means caused by the reason alone, by dianoia, by ratio, by the cognitive rational faculty. It, it needs that spark of divine truth within the heart that, to which the intellect has access, and then the spirit of the intellect is expressed through these philosophical arguments and so on and so forth. Therefore, in the modern world, super saturated as it is with this mental approach, this cognitive, this rational and logical approach, e exclusively of all properly intellectual openings on the one hand, and then the, the data of scientific discoveries and so on, and scientific theories on the other, mean that faith has been pushed out and that the the arguments required to restore faith have to come from a level higher than simply reason, even if they're expressed through reason or argumentation. So before I go to the next point, is there anybody who wishes to ask a question? All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Reza. I think we uh, reached our time limit. We thank you very much and very uh, enlightening commentary that you have given it and also to put the context uh, uh, of the book uh, written by uh, Dr. Lynx uh, uh, as well as uh, 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 an oral tradition yeah, uh, passed to you by uh, Dr. Ling himself what he has received uh, orally from from the masters yeah so this is very uh, fruitful and, and enlightening discussion yeah uh, we like to, IKD, we like to thank you very much for uh, making the time for us uh, to discuss about the book. Inshallah, we expect we can continue the seminar uh, regularly uh, in future. Yeah, with that, uh, we, on behalf of the audience, I would like to uh, thank you again uh, for, for, for your enlightening uh, uh, presentation of the seminar. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.